We went and viewed the museum of Mr. Richard Green, apothecary here, who told me he was proud of being a relation of Dr. Johnson's. It was truly a wonderful collection, both of antiquities and natural curiosities, and ingenious works of art. He had all the articles accurately arranged, with their names upon labels, printed at his own little press. And on the staircase leading to it was a board, with the names of contributors marked in gold letters. A printed catalog of the collection was to be had at booksellers. Johnson expressed his admiration of the activity and diligence and good fortune of Mr. Green in getting together, in his situation, so great a variety of things. And Mr. Green told me that Johnson once said to him, Sir, I should as soon have thought of building a man of war as of collecting such a museum. Mr. Green's obliging alacrity in showing it was very pleasing. His engraved portrait, with which he had favored me, has a motto truly characteristical of his disposition. Nemo sib sibi vivat. Let no man live for himself. A physician... Uh, footnote here tells us this is Dr. John Boswell, J.B.'s uncle. Being mentioned, who had lost his practice because his whimsical changing his religion had made people distrustful of him, I maintain that this was unreasonable, as religion is unconnected with medical skill. Johnson said, Sir, it is not unreasonable, for when people see a man absurd in what they understand, they may conclude the same of him in what they do not understand. If a physician were to take a eating of horse flesh, nobody would employ him, though one may eat horse flesh and be a very skillful physician. If a man were educated in an absurd religion, his continuing to profess it would not hurt him, though his changing to it would. We drank tea and coffee at Mr. Peter Garrick's, where was Mr. Mrs. Aston, one of the maiden sisters of Mrs. Walmsley's, wife of Johnson's best friend, and sister also of the lady of whom Johnson used to speak with the warmest admiration, by the name of Molly Aston, who was afterwards married to Captain Brody of the Navy. On Saturday, March 24th, we breakfasted with Mrs. Cobb, a widow lady who lived in an agreeable sequestered place close by the town called the Friary, it having been formerly a religious house. She and her niece, Mrs. Uh, Miss Eddy, were great admirers of Dr. Johnson, and he behaved to them with a kindness and easy pleasantry, such as we see between old and intimate acquaintance. He accompanied Mrs. Cobb to St. Mary's Church, and I went to the cathedral, where I was very much delighted with the music, finding it to be peculiarly solemn and accordant with the words of the service. We dined at Mr. Peter Garrick's, who was in a very lively humor, and verified Johnson's saying that if he had cultivated gaiety as much as his brother David, he might have equally excelled in it. He was today quite a London narrator, telling us a variety of anecdotes with that earnestness and attempt at mimicry which we usually find in the wits of the metropolis. Dr. Johnson went with me to the cathedral in the afternoon. It was grand and pleasing to contemplate this illustrious writer now full of fame, worshipping in the solemn temple of his native city. I returned to tea and coffee at Mr. Peter Garrick's, and then found Dr. Johnson at the Reverend Mr. Seward's, canon residentiary, who inhabited the bishop's palace, in which Mrs. Mr. Wamsley lived, in which had been the scene of many happy hours in Johnson's early life. Mr. Seward had, with ecclesiastical hospitality and politeness, asked me in the morning, merely as a stranger, to dine with him. And in the afternoon, when I was introduced to him, he asked Dr. Johnson and me to spend the evening and sup with him. He was a genteel, well-bred, dignified clergyman, had traveled with Lord Charles Fitzroy, uncle of the present Duke of Grafton, who died when abroad, and he had lived much in the great world. He was an ingenious and literary man who had published an edition of Beaumont and Fletcher and written verses in Dodsley's collection. His lady was the daughter of Mr. Hunter, Johnson's first schoolmaster. And now, for the first time, I had the pleasure of seeing his celebrated daughter, Miss Anna Seward, to whom I had since been indebted for many civilities, as well as being obliging some communications concerning Johnson.
Mr. Seward mentioned to us the observations which he had made upon the strata of earthen volcanoes, from which it appeared that they were so very different in depth at different periods that no calculation whatever could be made as to the time required for their formation. This fully refuted an anti mosaical remark introduced into Captain Bidone's entertaining tour, I hope needlessly, from a kind of vanity which is too common in those who have not sufficiently studied the most important of all subjects. Dr. Johnson indeed had said before, independent of this observation, Shall all the accumulated evidence of the history of the world, shall the authority of what is unquestionably the most ancient writing, be overturned by an uncertain remark such as this? On Monday, March 25th, we breakfasted at Mrs. Lucy Porter's. Johnson had sent an express to Dr. Taylor's acquainting him of our being at Lickfield, and Taylor had returned an answer that his post-chase should come for us that day. While we sat at breakfast, Dr. Johnson received a letter by the post which seemed to agitate him very much. When he had read it, he exclaimed, One of the most dreadful things that has happened in my time. The phrase, my time, like the word age, is usually understood to refer to an event of a public or general nature. I imagine something like an assassination of the king, like a gunpowder plot carried into ex execution, or like another fire of London. When I asked, what is it, sir? He answered, Mr. Thrale has lost his only son. This was no doubt a very great affliction to Mr. and Mrs. Thrale, where their friends would consider accordingly. But from the manner in which the intelligence of it was communicated by Johnson, it appeared for the moment to be comparatively small. I, however, soon felt a sincere concern and was curious to observe how Dr. Johnson would be affected. He said, This is a total extinction to their family as much as if they were sold into captivity. Upon my mentioning that Mr. Thrale had daughters who might inherit his wealth, Daughters, said Johnson warmly, He'll no more value his daughters than... I was going to speak... Sir, said he, don't you know how you yourself think? Sir, he wishes to propagate his name. In short, I saw male succession strong in his mind, even where there was no name, no family, or any long standing. I said it was lucky he was not present when this misfortune happened, Johnson said. It is lucky for me. People in distress never think that you feel enough. I said... And, sir, they will have the hope of seeing you, which will be a relief for the meantime. And when you get to them, the pain will be so far abated that they will be capable of being consoled by you, which, in the first violence of it, I believe, would not be the case. Johnson said, No, sir, violent pain in mind, like violent pain of body, must be severely felt. I said, I own, sir, I have not so much feeling for the distress of others as some people have or pretend to have, but I know this, that I would do all in my prayer to relieve them. Johnson said, Sir, it is an affectation to pretend to feel the distress of others as much as they do themselves. It is equally so as if one should pretend to feel as much pain while a friend's leg is cutting off as he does. No, sir, you have expressed the rational and just nature of sympathy. I would have gone to the extremity of the earth to have preserved this boy. He was soon quite calm. The letter was from Mr. Thrale's clerk and concluded, I need not say how much they wish to see you in London. He said, We shall hasten back from Taylor's. Mrs. Lucy Porter had some other ladies of the place talked a great deal of him, when he was out of the room, not only with veneration, but affection. It pleased me to find that he was so much beloved in his native city. Mrs. Aston, whom I had been, I had seen the preceding night, and her sister Mrs. Gastrell, a widow lady, had each a house and garden and pleasure ground prettily situated upon Stowhill, Stow Hill, a gentle eminence adjoining to Litchfield. Johnson walked away to dinner there, leaving me by myself without any apology. I wondered at this want of that facility of manners from which a man has no difficulty in carrying a friend to a house where he is intimate. 
I felt it very unpleasant to be thus left in solitude in a country town where I was an entire stranger, and began to think myself unkindly deserted. But I was soon relieved and convinced that my friend, instead of being deficient in delicacy, had conducted the matter with perfect propriety, for I received the following note in his handwriting. Mrs. Gastrell at the town at the lower house on Stowhill desires Mr. Boswell's company to dinner at two. I accepted of this invitation, and add here another proof how amiable his character was in the opinion of those who knew him best. I was not informed till afterwards that Mrs. Gastrell's husband was the clergyman who, while he lived at Stratford upon Avon, where he was proprietor of Shakespeare's garden, with Gothic barbarity cut down his mulberry tree, mulberry tree, and, as Dr. Johnson told me, did it to vex his neighbors. His lady, I had reason to believe, on the same authority, participated in the guilt of what the enthusiasts for our mortal bard deem almost a species of sacrilege. Footnote here about the cutting of the mulberry tree. See an accurate and animated statement of Mr. Gastrell's barbarity by Mr. Malone in a note on some account of the life of William Shakespeare, prefixed to his admirable edition of that poet's work, volume 1, page 118. After dinner, Dr. Johnson wrote a letter to Mrs. Thrale on the death of her son. I said it would be a very distressing to Thrale, but she would soon forget it, as she had so many things to think of. Johnson said, no, Sir Thrale will forget it first. She has many things that she may think of. He has many things that he must think of. This was a very just remark upon the different effect of the light pursuits which occupy a vacant and easy mind and those serious engagements with which arrest attention and keep us from brooding over grief. He was or he observed of Lord Bute. It was said of Augustus that it would have been better for Rome that he had never been born, or had never died. So it would have been better for this nation if Lord Bute had never been minister, or had never resigned. In the evening we went to the town hall, which was converted into a temporary theater, and saw Theodosius with the Stratford Jubilee. I was happy to see Dr. Johnson setting in a conspicuous part of the pit, and receiving affectionate homage from all his acquaintance. We were quite gay and merry. I afterwards mentioned to him that I condemned myself for being so, when poor Mr. and Mrs. Thrale were in such distress. Johnson said, You are wrong, sir. Twenty years hence, Mr. and Mrs. Thrale will not suffer much pain from the death of their son. Now, sir, you are to consider that distance of place as well as distance of time operates upon the human feelings. I would not have you be gay in the presence of the distress, because it would shock them. But you may be gay at a distance. Pain for the loss of a friend or of a relation whom we love is occasioned by the want which we feel. In times the vacuity is filled with something else, or sometimes the vacuity closes up of itself. Mr. Seward and Mr. Pearson another clergyman here, supped with us at our inn, and after they left us, we sat up late as we used to do in London. Here I shall record some fragments of my friend's conversation during this jaunt. Quoting Johnson here. Marriage, sir, is much more necessary to a man than to a woman, for he is much less able to supply himself with domestic comforts. You will recollect my sayings to some ladies the other day that I had often wondered why young women should marry, as they have so much more freedom and so much more attention paid to them while unmarried than when married. I indeed not, did not mention the strong reason for their marrying, the mechanical reason. I said, Why, this is a strong one, but does not imagination make it seem much more important than it is in reality? Is it not, to a certain degree, a delusion in us as well as in women? Johnson said, Why, yes, sir, but it is a delusion that is always beginning again. I said, I don't know, but there is, upon the whole, more a misery than happiness produced by that passion. Johnson said, I don't think so, sir. He said, Never speak of a man in his own presence. It is always indelicate and may be offensive. Questioning is not the mode of conversation among gentlemen. It is assuming a superiority, and it is particularly wrong to question a man concerning himself. 
There may be parts of his former life which he may not wish to be made known to other persons or even brought to his own recollection. A man should be careful never to tell tales of himself to his own disadvantage. People may be amused and laugh at the time, but they will be remembered and brought out against him upon some subsequent occasion. I can speak to that. Much may be done of a man who puts his whole mind to a particular object, but being so, Norton has made himself the great lawyer that he is allowed to be, by doing so. And he's talking about Sir Fletcher Norton, afterwards Speaker of the House of Commons, and in 1782 created Baron Grantley. I mention acquaintance of mine, says here Dr. John Bonswell, I think this is uncle, a secretary, spelled here, interesting, sectary, S-E-C-T-A-R-Y, who was a very religious man, who not only attended regularly on a public worship with those of his communion, but made a particular study of the scriptures, and even wrote a commentary on some parts of them. It was known to be very licentious in indulging himself with women, maintaining that men are to be saved by faith alone, and that the Christian religion has not prescribed any fixed rule for the intercourse between the sexes. Johnson answered, Sir, there is no trusting to that crazy piety. I observed that uh, it was strange how well Scotchmen were known to one another in their own country, though born in very distant counties. For we do not find that the gentlemen of neighboring counties in England are mutually known to each other. Johnson, with his usual acuteness, at once saw and explained the reason for this. Why, sir, you have Edinburgh, where the gentlemen from all your counties meet, and which is not a so large, but that they are well known. There is no real such common place of collection in England except London, where, from its great size and diffusion, many of those who reside in contiguous counties in England may long remain unknown to each other. And I'm going to stop there a little early. I've got something in the oven I've got to keep an eye on. Till next time, bye from Boswell.